As we're entering in the new year, I thought it'd be fitting to reflect on the nature of faith. We live by faith, we walk by faith, and so I think it is fitting as we come into the new year to consider faith and the nature of it. What kind of faith does God look upon? What kind of faith delights the heart of God? What kind of faith is good for us? There's different kinds of faith in the New Testament, and not all faiths are as good for us. Not all faiths are as God-honoring as others. In fact, there are some faiths in the New Testament where it talks about some people believing, but then you find out later that they weren't really believing, that they didn't have a saving faith. And so it's fitting for us as we enter the new year to consider the nature of faith. And so let us do that as we turn to Luke chapter 8, verses 40 and following. The title of today's message is Simple, Desperate Faith. But before we do that, we're just diving right into Luke, and so we need to get a little contextual bearings here. We can't just jump in. We need to find out where we're at geographically and contextually. What has happened up to this point in the Gospel of Luke? Well, Jesus had been commissioned by his Father and been baptized in Luke chapter 3, and from that point on, a lot had happened, as you can imagine, now that Jesus is conducting his ministry as he was Uh, baptized uh, by John the Baptist and commissioned by his father, he immediately is brought by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. And there he proves in that wilderness that he is the son who will accomplish and be successful where other previous sons were not. Adam was a son who was disobedient. He did not succeed where he was supposed to. He did not succeed in what he was called to do. Noah was a son who was called but but who also failed. David was a son who was called and failed. Solomon was a son who was called but failed. And here, this son is going to be able to accomplish and to succeed where these other previous sons did not. Adam, David, the nation of Israel is even God's son. And here, this son of God is going to be led into the wilderness like Israel of old. But instead of failing in succumbing to temptation and grumbling and sin like Israel did and all the sons previous to this son, this son now being led into the wilderness by the Spirit will succeed in every place where they did not. So Jesus, the Son of God, succeeds in this temptation. He does not succumb to Satan's tactics. He just demonstrates thereby that he is God's one true son. And then he, after this event, he commences his ministry, a ministry that is going to be consisting of teaching and preaching, of healing healing major illnesses and diseases, exercising demons and relieving people from years of demon possession, raising dead people to life, and then demonstrating his deity by calming a great storm in just a few passages previous. Just, uh, in fact, verses 22 through 25, Jesus calms a storm, demonstrating his deity to the amazement of his disciples. They're wondering, who is this guy? Because he's able to command the winds and the waves and they obey him. And then right after that, he demonstrates his, his godhood again, his deity again, by delivering a man with a demon. That's verses 26 and following. And after that, those two amazing events, we now see in verse 40, that he is returning. It says he return, He returns from delivering this man from the clutches of demon possession. And he is returning. Returning from where? Well, this demon ex, uh, exorcism happens in the place or the uh, country of the Gerasenes in the town of Gadara, which would have been about six or so miles southeast of the Sea of Galilee. So now he is returning to the the Galilee side of the Sea of Galilee. That's where we're at geographically. Jesus is returning to the Galilean side of the Sea of Galilee. And that's important because Jesus has garnered a lot of popularity in that area. And so now that we have our geographical setting, we can start to now make our way through this passage. We are now in the Galilean region on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. And it says that the crowd welcomed him. Well, why do they welcome him? Well, because he's been, he's garnered this reputation of healing miracles, of exercising demons, of raising people to life. And so people want to be near Jesus. People want to be around Jesus. People want healing from Jesus. People want Jesus for various reasons, but nevertheless, his popularity has grown. And it says that Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, and they are all waiting for him, eagerly wanting him for for whatever reason, And there was a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue. 
Now, this ruler of the synagogue, this phrase meant that this man was a Jew and he would have been in charge of the logistics of the synagogue. He kind of been like the, the, the men working here. Someone would have been in charge making sure of all the worship logistics were in order. Someone is kind of in charge of that here, maybe at this church. Similar at the, the synagogue, he would have been in charge of, making care of taking care of all the, the worship logistics at the synagogue. He is a ruler of the synagogue. But Jairus' response to Jesus is very different than all the religious leaders you've met up to this point in the Gospel of Luke. If you've read through the Gospel of Luke and your trek through the Bible, you know that up to this point, the religious leaders do not take kindly to Jesus. They're not thrilled with his ministry philosophy. In fact, in Luke 6, 6 through 11, Just a few months prior to this incident, Jesus had entered a synagogue and healed a man with a withered hand. And you might be thinking, well, that's great, because now this man's livelihood is restored. His life is restored. To have a withered hand in this culture where you're working with your hands in most professions, this would have robbed this man of his livelihood most likely, and to restore his hand would have been to restore his livelihood. And so this is a good thing that Jesus does to this man with a withered hand. Well, the Pharisees were not thrilled about that. Luke summarizes the response of the scribes and Pharisees this way. He says, quote, and this is Luke 6, 11, but they were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. By his compassion and care for the physical needs of others, Jesus was infuriating the religious leaders who cared more about religious form and ritual and tradition than caring for others in real practical ways. So, The religious leaders are not thrilled about Jesus. So then when you read about this man here, who then it says, falling at Jesus' feet, this is out of step for the religious leaders. Here you have a ruler of the synagogue going against the grain of many, if not most, of the religious leaders in Israel by not only engaging with Jesus, but believe it or not, actually humbling himself below Jesus, which would have been absolutely out of sync with how the religious leaders were treating Jesus at this point. Engaging with him positively, well, maybe, but humbling himself before Jesus, not likely. Given the underlying hostility that the religious leaders were starting to feel towards Jesus, Jairus' act here of bowing before and coming before and laying himself at Jesus' feet was an act of true humility. He was endangering his reputation. Think of it. If you are in league with the religious leaders who have by and large rejected Jesus and will have none of this engaging with him positively or or much more bowing before him humbly like this, what are you doing but endangering not only your reputation, reputation, but probably your livelihood? You're not going to be the ruler of the synagogue for much longer. Why take this risk? That's the setting. Here here we have this, this... Man, a Jew, a religious leader, among the other other religious leaders, endangering his reputation, possibly his livelihood, to bow before Jesus and plead with him, why would you take that risk? Why did he take that risk? Well, there's a good reason why he took that risk. Tells us right here, falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter who was about 12 years of age, and she was dying. If you have a little girl who means the world to you and you know of someone nearby who has a ironclad reputation for healing people, you will be compelled to cast aside any care for what others think about you and fall down before the one who can heal her. That's what desperation does. It drives you to cast aside any care for what other people might think of you. What's most important is to get that daughter healed. I have a daughter. She's five years old. She's not 12. But I, I, this churns up in me a sense of desperation. I, I get it now. What this would do to a, a man whose daughter is a, on, the, on her deathbed. This act also demonstrates that Jairus is believing in Jesus. He believes that he can heal her. And again, this is completely out of step with the way the religious leaders were responding towards Jesus. In John 9, for example, when a man born uh, who is blind from birth is healed, the religious leaders reject the idea that Jesus could have done it. They just, just, it couldn't have been him. They refuse to believe it. Elsewhere where he's healing people, they eventually attribute that healing 
to demons. So the, the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, do not want to attribute true healing to Jesus. But this, this guy, he believes that Jesus can heal. He's out of step with the religious leaders at the time. So the fact that Jairus comes to Jesus to heal his daughter is an indication that true faith is starting to emerge in this unlikely man. But it was desperation that drove him to Jesus, wasn't it? It was desperation that drove him to faith in Christ. So Jesus goes to heal his daughter. That's what the phrase, as Jesus went, implies. He acquiesces to the request. Jairus is desperate. He throws himself down before Jesus. He pleads with him, come and heal my daughter. Jesus is going to go with him. And you could imagine the relief that would have passed over Jairus, right? Just the relief. Oh, he's coming. Everything's going to be fine. Everything is going to be good. Nothing to worry about anymore. People make way. Jesus is coming. He's going to take care of this horrible situation that my family is undergoing. But now he's making his way to his, Jairus' house. And the people, it says, in verse 42, pressed around him. The word pressed can be translated choked, actually. Elsewhere in the parable of the soils, it's translated choked. So it's kind of a mosh pit in there, you could say. Uh, it's a lot of just pressing in on Jesus, crushing him. This, this large crowd is trying to get at Jesus. They're falling, they're walking with Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's a strong word. And he's getting crushed, he's getting pressed, he's getting choked by all this people. This is how large this entourage is. And there within this crowd, there's, and that's important, that's an important detail that Luke is including, as we'll see in a moment, because there's a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. What happens? Well, this discharge of blood was likely a hemorrhage in her uterus that was causing unceasing bleeding. And ladies, you know that this would be incredibly embarrassing, very uncomfortable. And it's unlikely that she would have been able to keep this a secret. So this ailment would have limited severely her social life. Most importantly, this ailment would have kept her perpetually ceremonially unclean, according to Leviticus 15. So she couldn't take part in any kind of uh, corporate worship. So her life, since this hemorrhage began 12 years ago, just think of that. This illness, this ailment, 12 years ago it began, would have significantly limited her life and made her life generally miserable. This is not a, just a small little hangnail. This is something that disrupts the entire life, socially, religiously. But to add insult to injury, she has spent all that she has, but she cannot be healed. It says here, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. Now, just stop for a moment there because we need to sort some things out. You might have a footnote in your ESV. If you're using the ESV, you have a little footnote that says some manuscripts omit that phrase, namely that she had spent all of her living on physicians. That's the, the key phrase, living on the, the physicians part is the, the, the big issue here. If you're reading from the New American Standard, you may find that it doesn't even include that phrase. It just said she could not be healed by anyone. Here's the situation. As Luke would have written his original document, that's the inspired, inerrant word of God. As Luke finished it and dispatched that original document, that's the inerrant word of God. Well, over time, that document's going to be copied. In fact, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, uh, I'm sorry, in the, the first century, in these New Testament times, the manuscripts were being uh, copied at a breakneck speed because everyone wanted a piece of the scriptures. And so lots of copying of manuscripts going on, which is why we have so many available today to co compare and contrast to get back to that original text because there was so much being copied uh, back in the first century. Well, while, while there was copying of Luke's gospel happening, uh, apparently either this phrase was taken out or this phrase was inserted in. And the question is, is what did Luke write originally? Did he include this phrase about physicians? Thankfully, we have the Gospel of Mark, which tells us that she had spent all of her money on physicians. So that issue is not a problem. We do know that she had spent her money on physicians. The question is, is does Luke include this 
to make to indicate that no one could to, could heal her, or does he not include that because he himself is a physician and he doesn't want to throw his fellow physicians under the bus? That's the question, and so. It, it's just a challenging question. There's, a, there's manuscript evidence, there's internal evidence, and I used to be pretty strong on the, the, the Luke included this physician phrase, and I've kind of tilted the other way. But here's the beauty of it. Because of what Mark says, and because of Luke's clear point, what he's, he's saying, it's, it's that whether or not he has physicians or not, the point is, is that she could not be healed by anyone. That's the issue. She could not be healed by anyone. So even though there's a little bit of difficulty here determining whether or not he included that phrase about physicians or not, we are, we are not in any doubt about this. She could not be healed by anyone. That is abundantly clear. And we have Mark to fill in in Mark chapter 5 about the physicians part. So no trouble there, no problem there. The point is simply that she could not be healed by anyone. She had been suffering for 12 years, and now that she has spent everything on physicians, which Mark clearly tells us, she has absolutely nowhere to turn. That's the point that Luke is making for us and that he wants us to get. She has nowhere to turn. This is utter desperation. You've tried everything. You've gone to specialists. You've gone to doctors. You've traveled overseas. You've done everything to cure this ailment. You can't cure it. There's nothing left for you to do. Now, there's an important detail that I didn't notice until recently that I want us to notice. Notice how old Jairus' daughter is. She's 12. How long has this been, lady been suffering with this ailment? 12 years in the same year this is this is so in the same year this is putting this together in the same year that Jairus and his wife welcomed their little girl into the world with joy and hope and promise the woman whose life had been blessed and happy up to this point we we can surmise is now beset with a never ending life disrupting affliction that cannot be healed for 12 years Jairus enjoyed his daughter delighted in her doted on her which is this is kind of a sanctified imagination here. That's just what you do when you have a daughter, right? I mean, I, I'm constantly doting on my daughter to the sh- uh, chagrin of my sons. They want more doting. Well, my daughter tends to get a lot of it. Um, but here, here's this uh, Jairus doting on his do- daughter, enjoying his daughter, delighting in her. But across town for those same 12 years, a woman who was unlikely to be able to even bear children due to her condition, was enduring a painful disease that ruined much of her life. Same 12 years. It's a contrast. Now, after those same 12 years, Jairus' daughter is dying, and the woman has no more money to spend on healing herself. Jairus and the woman are now in the same desperate place. This is not coincidental. This is providence working from the beginning of time to bring this event together to teach us about the nature of faith. Two different people from two very different backgrounds brought together by one common factor, their need for Jesus Christ. Absolute desperation. Nowhere else to turn. In God's providence, he brings this together. They have no more earthly hope. Their expectation for joy in this life is gone. I think that's what we're supposed to gather from the description of this scenario. A, A father whose daughter is about to die and a woman who has an incurable disease that disrupts all of her life. So what does desperation drive you to do? It drives you to cast aside the fear of man and to throw yourself before Jesus and plead for his mercy to heal your only daughter. It causes you to jump into a dense crowd and to make your way to Jesus so that you might touch the fringe of his garment. That's what desperation does. Matthew and Mark tell us what the woman was even thinking on her way to touch Jesus. Matthew 6, 21. If I only touch his garment, I shall get well. And it wasn't unreasonable for this lady to think that. He was the one who was healing all kinds of people with a mere touch. In some cases, he was healing people without a word, not even being in proximity to that person. Just a word traveling over space into this person's body to to heal. 
He was raising dead people to life. He was relieving people of demon possession. This was the son of God. All I need to do is touch him and I will be made well. And so what happened is this woman's desperation enabled to see Jesus clearly and believe in him. Desperation in this case was eye-opening, you might say. Well, her faith leads immediately to her deliverance from this affliction. She came up behind him, Luke says, and touched the fringe of his garment and immediately, not a few days down the road, not a year from now, immediately she was healed. Her discharge of blood ceased. Now, this is a slightly humorous exchange here, and I think we're supposed to see it as such. Jesus said, who was it that touched me? Right? Remember what I said about the mosh pit here? The entourage crushing in, pressing in on Jesus. Who, Jesus now, okay, you're in this, who touched me? Right? Well, all denied it. And Peter, Peter with, well, again, a very reasonable response given the circumstances says, Master, the crowds are surrounding you and pressing in on you. Jesus, listen, um, okay, how are we supposed to sort this out? Because... There are people pressing in on you at all sides. Everybody's grabbing at you. Why would you even ask a question like that? It's, eh, right? Well, he's not talking about the kind of grabbing and touching you get when you're in this kind of entanglement with other people as you're a big entourage walking down the street. He's not talking about that kind of touch. He's talking about a touch of faith when someone steps out and reaches and grabs a hold of the Messiah Because they have nowhere else to turn, believing that he will deliver them. That's the kind of touch he's talking about, Peter. Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out for me. That's the kind of touching I'm talking about, Peter. Someone touched me with desperate faith. Well, the woman sees that she can't conceal what's happened. You know, had this not occurred, had Jesus not said that, she could have exited Stage right, made her way down the street, skipping and singing, I like to imagine, all the way down the road because of what had just happened. But Jesus now brings a spotlight on her. No one would have known about this episode, but Jesus says, who someone touched me. So now she has to to fess up. She knows she cannot escape his gaze. He can see into her soul. So she now has to confess what she has done. And perhaps she's frightened because... She doesn't want Jesus to think that she was presuming on him. But nevertheless, it says that she comes down. It says, Jesus says, someone touched me. In the, verse 47, and when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, falling down before him and declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him. What was Jesus's response? Was it rebuke? Was it correction? Not at all. Verse 48, he said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, this is an important phrase. If you want to turn with me over just briefly in your Bibles, over to chapter 7, verse 50 of Luke. Right at the end of the story about the the prostitute who had been forgiven by Jesus. Remember that one? Remember that story? She is pouring out her love for Jesus because she had been given, forgiven such a great load of sin. Jesus ends that episode with this. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's the exact same phrase in the original as this phrase here. Only the ESV renders it, your faith has made you well. It can very well say your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And I, I take it to be that. Rendering It should be your faith has saved you because it's coming right on the heels of this story about the prostitute. And the story of the prostitute is clearly, it clearly has spiritual meaning there. Her sins have been forgiven. All of that years and life of debauchery, it's been forgiven. Now you can go in peace because you have peace with God. Now the same phrase is being used here for this uh, Lady, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. 
She could go live her life in true peace. She had believed in Jesus Christ. Her desperation enabled her to see Jesus for who he really was. She reached out in desperation and in faith for his help. And this faith was therefore not temporary. It was saving faith. She not only found physical healing and physical relief of her burden that day, as wonderful as that gift was, which it was a wonderful gift. We don't want to downplay that. Jesus was doing good to people, and that often meant doing physical good to them. So Jesus gives her this wonderful gift of healing, but remember what we said about her being ceremonially unclean. Again, this is not a throwaway detail. To be ceremonially unclean means that you cannot go into God's presence for worship. God is going to remove that restriction now. He's going to remove that ailment. Her hemorrhage made her ceremonially unclean, but her sin had made her eternally unclean. By removing her ceremonial uncleanness, Jesus was showing that her eternal uncleanness was removed. How? By a mere grasp of Jesus' garment. Simple, desperate faith was the means by which the power of Jesus flowed from him to this woman into her body and into her soul. Go in peace. I believe you'll meet and I will meet this lady in heaven someday. She had saving faith. She could go in peace. Well, that's a wonderful event, but we can't stop there. God in his providence interweaving this scenario in ways that only he can do. We have now right immediately following that glorious event. Just consider for a moment the glory of that event. The the joy that this woman is going home with now. Physical ailment gone, but more importantly, spiritual ailment gone. It comes, it, it, it is followed directly by this. Verse 49, a very sad turn of events, a very tragic turn of events. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. Jesus has even had a moment to to, to send this lady off in joy. Then right after that, this situation occurs where the, the child has died. The child has died. Remember how the uh, synagogue leader would have been feeling, you know, you, you, your daughter's dying. You get Jesus to, to come with you to go heal your daughter. And there's a, there's a welling up of encouragement and hope. And now hope is dashed. And trying to put myself in the place of this religious, uh, this synagogue leader, would you be tempted to, to think if this lady had not stopped him, he may have gotten there in time. Temptation to doubt, Temptation to be angry and to be bitter. My daughter is dead. Hope is lost. It's done. We're done. Well, Jesus doesn't rebuke any unbelief here. He says, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. He gives him a word of encouragement, a word of hope. You were believing in me. Continue to believe in me. I don't just heal sickness. I raised the dead, as you know. There had already been a previous raising of a dead uh, person prior to this event in chapter 7, verses 11 and following. Jesus is the one who raises the dead. So they continue to the ruler's house. But it says here that only Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the mother, the father and the mother of the child were allowed to enter and all were weeping and mourning for her. And you might be thinking, wow, whoa, that was quick. Why do they already have the official uh, mourners there to start mourning over the child? Well, due to the rate of decomposition, the mourning had to, had, had to start soon. The official funeral ceremonies had to start almost immediately after death because there's no way of really preserving the body indefinitely. So you had to start this process very early on. And Jesus is now going to take them to the place, to the house. He's only going to allow James and Peter and John and the father and the mother 
into the, the house. And he gives them encouragement as well. He says, do not weep for she is not dead, but sleeping. So Jesus just giving word of hope after hope after hope, not word of rebuke, but of encouragement and, and hope. As, as he walks through each incident, each scenario. But this now, this response that he gives, she is not dead but sleeping, this response is not met with faith. It's actually met with derision. What happens? Well, the, the, the mourners, it says in verse 53, they laughed at him knowing that she was dead. This is not a jolly laugh like, ha ha, good joke. This is a laugh of con- uh, condescension. This was a di- dismissive laugh. You're not mourning for a child and then all of a sudden on a turn of a dime start laughing heartily at a funny joke. That would be totally unfitting. That's not what's happening here. This is a laugh of derision. Jesus, you know, I hate to break it to you. I know you're the miracle worker around here, but uh, the child's dead, okay? But why would they laugh in dismissal? A little while ago, we just mentioned it, in a town about 20 miles south in Nain, Jesus had raised a widow's son to life. And it is likely that this story would have made its way up through the uh, up to that area, up to the Galilean region, because Luke says in Luke 7, 17, after he had raised the widow's son, he said, this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. So they would have likely heard of that raising of the dead son. In light of Jesus's power, a power that he had already displayed 20 miles south, the child state was temporary, but they couldn't see that. It was, though, it was as though she was sleeping because it was just like a sleeping child that Jesus had to just walk into the room and wake up. Time for breakfast. Time for school. To Jesus, that's what it was like. But they didn't see it that way. That's why they laughed in derision. Well, Jesus is completely unfazed by their condescension. And he is going to now step into the presence of the child. He is now going to step into into death. Death, the great enemy, the great equalizer, the thief of life and joy and happiness has crept into this little family and taken their 12-year-old daughter. But all Jesus has to do is this, verse 54, but taking her by the hand, he called saying, child, arise. Luke translates the Aramaic phrase that Jesus apparently used since Mark tells us that Jesus said, Talitha kum, which literally means little girl arise. So with a mere word, the creator of the universe reverses death and brings a dead girl to life. It says her spirit returned and she got up at once and apparently dying, getting sick, dying, and then being raised to life causes you to be hungry because Jesus says here immediately, He directed that something should be given her to eat. See, death is unpredictable. It's no respecter of persons. It is the one thing that strikes fear into all of Adam's offspring. Have we not seen that in the last two years? People are enslaved to the fear of death. That's Hebrews chapter 2. People fear it because it's because of its utter unavoidable unavoidability and because of its finality. That's why people fear it. They fear it because their conscience bears witness that they are under judgment. Though they may not be able to identify all that their conscience is telling them, they know that they will stand at some level. They know they'll stand before a judge. And so all of Adam's offspring are enslaved to the fear of death. No one can avoid it. Even Jeff Bezos can't escape it, even though he is spending millions of dollars to come up with a cure for death. Let's end the suspense for him and say there is no cure for death, at least humanly speaking. Yet this man, Christ Jesus, has the power over death. All he has to do is speak a little word to this girl and she gets up. She's raised from the dead. This is the Jesus that you need. 
This is the Jesus who will give you hope to overcome the fear of death. We note that Jesus is very practical. He, he says that something should be given her to eat. Well, the, the parents are amazed, it says in verse six, verse 56. Her parents were amazed. But then Jesus does something unexpected. He charged them to tell no one what had happened. And that's interesting. That's interesting because in previous miracles up to this point, he hasn't given such a warning. For example, the woman with the hemorrhage wasn't told to keep quiet. Jesus actually told the uh, garrison demoniac to go tell everyone what God had done for him. He didn't tell his disciples to keep quiet about the storm. He didn't tell the widow not to say anything about her son's resurrection. He didn't tell the man with the withered hand not to say anything. He didn't issue a gag order on all the people he healed in Tyre and Sidon or the paralytic or the leper or the man with the unclean demon in Capernaum. So why would he tell these parents, and obviously by implication, Peter, James, and John, to say nothing about the details of this miracle. Well, first thing we should notice is that this was, uh, for the most part, a private miracle. These other miracles that I had mentioned, uh, except for the ones with the disciples on the boat and the storm, they were all public. So it makes sense in some way that in, in this case, it would have been easier to keep this concealed than the other ones that were public. Those other public miracles are just explodes like wildfire, people are going to know about it. So in, in that sense, it makes sense that you would keep this private. But is, but is that really what's going on here? Is that the only reason? Jesus is just kind of thinking pragmatically here? I don't think so. Here's how I think we should understand this, this charge to tell, them that no, tell no one what has happened. Unbelief was displayed previously by these mourners and these others in the crowd by their laugh of derision. They had displayed their unbelief by their laughter. Jesus, therefore, did not want to provide them detailed knowledge of the actual miracle because they had demonstrated that they weren't really believing in Jesus anyway. Laughter in the scripture can be a symptom of unbelief. You see that in scripture. So it's not any stretch to see the mourner's laughter as an indication that they weren't really believing in Christ. And then in the Old, Old Testament and even in the New Testament, keeping of revelation from people is a sign of judgment. These two stories, the, women with, the woman with the hemorrhage and the ruler's daughter, highlight the means by which the recipients get Jesus' power into their life. It's by faith. Simple Desperate faith. The woman believed and grasped hold of Jesus' garment. The ruler, out of desperation, reached out to Jesus to heal his daughter. And then, after she had died, the both parents believed and received their daughter back by resurrection. To laugh in condescension at the Son of God, who had already proved his power multiple times over, was to demonstrate proud, self-sufficient unbelief, not desperate Faith. So I believe Jesus withholds the details of this miracles from others who had demonstrated that unbelief. And you might be thinking, well, wouldn't it be pretty hard to keep this a secret? I mean, for, at one moment, this, this girl is dead and now she's alive and she would have walked, walked out alive, though she's previously dead. And you'd called all the mourners around and clearly had, her death had been confirmed. And, and, and yes, I, I'm not suggesting that the miracle would not eventually be made public. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. In fact, Matthew says that the report of this event went out through all the district. Nevertheless, I believe that Jesus wanted his disciples and his parents to keep the details of this miracle private and not to reveal what had really transpired in the house due to the unbelief that had been dis displayed by these mourners. See, the theme that we get here in this passage is a theme that has been unfolding ever since Jesus' ministry commenced in Luke chapter 3. The theme is that we are saved by faith. Simple faith. Looking away from yourself to Jesus Christ. Laying ourselves upon him. Grasping a hold of him. As we see it in this passage and in the story of the prostitute that we mentioned earlier. And in the story even earlier than that of the centurion who received 
help from Jesus for his servant. True faith is true faith in Jesus is born out of desperation. True faith in Jesus is born out of desperation. You have nowhere else to turn for forgiveness. You have nowhere else to turn for resurrection. You have nowhere else to turn for help. You come to Christ desperate. You come to Christ as the only one who can forgive you, who can raise you from the dead, and you find in him complete sufficiency for all your needs. And you might be thinking, Derek, is my faith des- am I desperate enough? Here's, here's the beauty of it. Desperate faith doesn't ponder about how desperate it is. It just goes to Jesus. Desperate faith just goes to Christ. It doesn't sit back and ponder and get introspective. Am I desperate enough, Lord? That's not what desperate faith does. It goes to Jesus. That's what it does. And that's what these people do. You talk with your neighbors and you talk with your friends about Christ. And they, and they refuse to believe. Do they need more exhortation to believe? Do they need more evidence? Perhaps. But the root reason why they don't believe in Jesus is because they're not desperate. If you are here today for the first time, so I just want to speak to those of you who might be visiting or here for the first time or you've been here for the last couple of weeks and and you know that you're not in Christ. You haven't believed in him. You haven't repented in him. Let me speak to you for a moment with love and in honesty. You have nothing without Jesus Christ. Your wealth will soon be gone. Your health will someday fail. Your sin has created an infinite debt that you cannot pay back. Your religious activities and your good deeds cannot wipe away the sin that you have committed against your creator. Your soul is unclean before God and you are dead in transgression and sin. The next major event in your life of any import is the final judgment where you will stand before a holy God who will judge you for rejecting his glorious and gracious person, which is expressed in his good and glorious word. You are in an in a eternally precarious situation with nowhere to turn. No religion, no religious figure, no mantra, no amount of good works in society can provide you with the forgiveness of all your sins, but Jesus can. No one else can provide you with eternal life, but Jesus can. No one else can resurrect you from from spiritual death, but Jesus can. Isaiah asks in Isaiah 40 and elsewhere in the book of Isaiah, God asks through the prophet Isaiah a rhetorical question. To whom will you compare me? The answer is no one. You can search high and low. You can search worldwide to find a God like Jesus Christ. You can search for a savior like Jesus Christ. You will find no one. No one can resurrect you from the dead. No one can forgive your sins. No one can provide you with an eternal inheritance that will not fade away, but Jesus can. No one can satisfy your soul with hope and peace and spiritual pleasure now and for all eternity, but Jesus can. Your situation is desperate. And again, if you're here today apart from Christ, we just pray that you would go to Christ in that desperation. We actually pray that you would become desperate, that the Lord would give you that grace to recognize that apart from Christ, you have nothing. And in Christ, you have everything. In Jesus, you have a wonderful, merciful Savior who says to the desperate, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And those of us who are believers, and we'll close with this, those of us who are believers, here's the great irony. Our faith is often weak, and it's often brittle, precisely because we don't see our desperation well enough. Isn't that that a great irony? Yet it is Christianity To say with the Apostle Paul, this is is authentic Christianity, to say with the Apostle Paul, I will boast in my weaknesses. I will boast in my troubles because it is through that weakness that Christ's power shines and enables most powerfully. That is Christianity. We don't recognize our desperation as we should. In and of ourselves, we are sick and blind and naked. We are full of sin. 
We are utterly dependent, that's all of us, on the mercy of Christ every single moment of every day. We need Christ to help us preach the word on a Sunday morning. We need Christ to help us at our jobs. We need Christ to save our children. We need Christ to provide for us over here. We need Christ to mend this relationship over here. These are all gifts of Christ that come by his mercy. We are utterly dependent upon his grace and his kindness every day. We need Christ to move mountains on our behalf. We need him to heal relationships. We need him to save our family members and our friends. We need him to provide for our needs. We have nothing without Christ. Yet he calls out to us with all of his bounty, come and eat and enjoy. Find in me all that you need in this life and in the next. He invites us to come and enjoy him. And when we start to see our desperation, we will start to see the hand of Christ in our lives, I believe. We will start to see more of his goodness, more of his mercy in our lives and in the lives of others. So let's go now to God for just a moment and, and pray to him and to cry out to him and even ask him. And, and, and you might be thinking, boy, Derek, uh, I, I, I don't know about all this. Would you at least pray to God to, to give you the grace of, of desperation that we might call out to him with longing hearts, knowing that only Christ can satisfy us. Let's pray to him now. Pray like these, go to him like these people in Luke's gospel went to him in desperation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, utterly desperate. We look to you, not ourselves. Help us to look to you and not ourselves. It is so easy to trust in ourselves, our strength, our wealth, our abilities. Good things you give us. You are the giver of these good gifts, yet our hearts easily drift towards relying upon them. Lord, we need daily forgiveness of sin. Lord, we need daily bread. We need daily provision. God, we want you to save our neighbors and our family and friends that we know. We need you to continue to provide for us the freedom to worship. So we need you to establish wise leadership around us in our country and in our state. God, we need you to mend broken relationships. We need you to help us to see our own deficiencies so that we might not lean upon ourselves, but lean upon you and the help you've given us in the body of Christ. God, we're deficient. You are good. You give us everything that we need, will you help us to lay ourselves before you humbly, knowing that you will lift our head, that you will raise us up, that you will give us all that we need and infinitely more. In Jesus' name, amen.